The book of Acts start telling the story about how after Jesus rose from the dead and how the people who were following Him spread the message that He was alive and He was the Savior of the world. Fifty days after Passover was the Feast of Pentecost and during Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on those early Christians. They preached the message that Jesus had risen from the dead and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that more than 3,000 came to follow Christ and were baptized that very day. The book of Acts tells us how chapter after chapter after chapter this gospel movement began to grow. One of the things you see in almost every page, almost every chapter, is that the way the gospel would advance to a new level, to a greater impact, is often through this eruption. Ellen White says a very deep, profound statement. God never leads His children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with Him. Ministry of Healing, page 479. Friends, many times this eruption can be used by God to bring us into a greater era of spiritual growth and effectiveness. What looks like the end of something actually becomes a new beginning of something even greater. As Dr. Rice once wrote, a demonic disruption can become a divine interruption and can cause a gospel eruption. It could happen in your life in your family and in the life of the church as it happened in the book of Acts. The Bible say in Acts chapter 8, and I will start reading the second phrase in the verse 1, Acts chapter 8, eight the second phrase of verse 1 through verse 4. Let us read. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered through the land of Judea, Samaria. Devoted men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, pay attention, was ravaging the church. He went into house after house, dragging men and women off, put them together in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Jesus rose from the dead. The apostles began to preach that He was alive and thousands of people believed and were baptized. Thousands are now becoming convert and move, most of them moved and stayed in Jerusalem. And I was just thinking, it's natural to stay in Jerusalem. They want to be right there was the action was taking place. The apostles and leaders that Jesus had trained were there in Jerusalem. The best teachers were there in Jerusalem. Peter was there, John was there, James was there, Thomas was there, Matthew was there. The believers were gathered in Jerusalem and the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and prayer and daily people were coming into the church that is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Everybody was excited, enjoying the moment, happy seeing the growth and bright perspectives of the church. And then, out of nowhere, a disruption broke out, something no one was expecting or prepared for. Question, does it sound familiar? Persecution broke out. At first, it was just isolated. Stephen becomes the first martyr in the Christian movement. He was murdered for his faith, and the responsible one for it was Saul. All of a sudden, the events have really taken a tragic turn. In fact, the description of it in verse 3 is so graphic, saying, Saul is ravaging the church. The New Living Translation says, he was going everywhere to destroy it. And I'm not trying just to turn it into a metaphor. It is a real and historical account. Ellen White says, so continued to persecute the church of God, hunting them down. 
seizing them in their houses and delivering them up to the priests and rulers for imprisonment and death. His zeal in carrying forward this persecution brought terror to the Christian at Jerusalem, Acts of Apostles 101. This early church movement was exploding, growing exponentially, and now they go through a time of deep loss and grief where this evil presence is now going house to house, family to family, person to person, and ravaging the church, killing some and dragging men to prison. They were confined, they were afraid, they could not get out, they could not go around. In other words, we can say they were quarantined. And it has so many commonalities with things that we may and are experiencing today. And yet, look at what the verse says. So, those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Because of this ravaging of the church, the people that hadn't yet been arrested, they left Jerusalem, all scattered. They went back to their towns, they went back to their villages, and everywhere they went, they were sharing the message that Jesus was alive. The persecution didn't stop them. The lack of pastors didn't stop them. Closed churches didn't stop them. The lack of fan, funds didn't stop them. Friends, nothing. Absolutely nothing can stop God's movement when the Holy Spirit leads it. The church spread out. It was good to be gathered. But listen, the church was never meant simply to gather in one place. The mission of the church was to go into all the world and share the message of Christ. So, what was a disruption to the church's work became a divine and providential interruption to scatter. And when the church was scattered and carried the message, then it became a gospel eruption. Look at what Ellen White says about it in Acts of Apostles, page 105. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it, they, apostles and leaders, were in danger of taking a curse that would lead them all to be satisfied with what had been accomplished. The Bible does not teach that God is somehow the author of evil or that He inflicts punishment upon us. But God uses all things to accomplish His purpose. We grow through hard times. We become more like Christ when we go through hardship and trials. We are more open to listen in trials and hardship. We seek for the Lord and when we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to Him, that is the time we find Him. I must to confess that it happened to me. Living alone for 11 years near Siberia, no friends, no family, no support, no money, that was the time I learned to pray more. That was the time I learned to read more the Bible, seek more for good advices, and trust less in myself. And I praise God daily for my mission experience, for my trials and hardships. And I always pray, Lord, if I ever become self-confident as Moses sent me to another mission desert experience, Give me another mission, not by power, Lord, not by my position, Lord, not by my connections, Lord, but Lord, may it all be done through your gracious and mighty hand and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians is written by someone who knew now what suffering meant. Before, the persecutor was Saul, now the persecuted is Paul. And I love these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Paul is writing and he says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around our body the death of Jesus so that 
the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. At the end of 2020, we could say, yes, we are disappointed, but we are not despaired. We are concerned, yes, but we have not conceded. We are struggling, but we haven't surrendered. We are disrupted, but we are not devastated. We are down, but we are not out. And then Paul goes to verse 17 and 18 when he says a beautiful passage, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what we can see, but what we cannot see since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Remember this, friends. When we go through difficult circumstances, even if you may not understand what is happening in a season of disruption, here are some things we need to know. God is at work. Yes, He is. God is working in us, humbling us, strengthening us, instructing us, preparing us. God work inside me and inside you, inside the church, and outside the church. He's doing something, and I hope and pray that sometime soon all of us could say, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He works in me, but also God works around me. In the inspiring book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 10, Ellen White says, If received in faith the trial that sometimes seems so bitter and hard to bear, will prove a blessing. That cruel blow that blights the joys of earth will be the means of turning our eyes to heaven. How many there are who would never have known Jesus had not sorrow led them to seek comfort in Him. God is working in us, God is working around us, and God is working through us. The big deal, look, is not God blessing us, but what God wants to do through us in order to advance His kingdom. I used to say God never called me to be successful, but He always called me to be faithful. Again and again you see in the book of Acts the growth of the church tied to disruption. It was a beautiful thing when the church could gather in Jerusalem. Please, hear me here. I love the gathering of the church. I've given many years of my ministerial life to the local church. This is the base where most of the church action happens. But could it be, friends, that in our culture, most of the time we build a strategy on the idea of the church gathered? But what if God may want us to embrace a strategy of the church scattered? In the midst of disruption, you need to ask this question again. Is our mission simply to gather? Is that our mission? Did Jesus say, I have come that you might gather? No, He has said, I come so that you will go and make disciples of all nations. The mission of our church is to spread news that Jesus is alive, that He is the Creator, that He is our only Savior, that He is our High Priest in the heavenly sanctuary, and will soon come to take us all home. That's our mission, to spread the three angels' messages and make disciples to all nations. What if God wants us to do something in this season to remind us that the mission was never about the gathering of the church only, but it was about the scattering of the church? I understand why they wanted to gather in Jerusalem. Peter was there. Who does not want to hear Peter's new sermon series on how to walk on water? Who does not want to hear John's new sermon series, What I Saw at the Transfiguration? Who does not want to hear Matthew teaching about how to invite all your lost friends? Who does not want to hear Thomas talking about how to overcome doubt? They were sitting at the apostles' feet. Of course they want to be there. But God allowed them to be scattered. I'm imagining now the Holy Spirit whispering into their ears saying, Now you are going to take all those notes you've been scribbling and all those things you've been learning. And guess what? 
You are going to tell to the world that Jesus is alive. And that's exactly what happened. And the church gathered became the church scattered. And the church scattered, listen, became the church that mattered. Then, in a very short time, a handful of committed Christians took the gospel to a whole new level. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they preached to three continents in just a few years. Europe heard of Jesus. Africa heard of Jesus. Asia heard of Jesus. The Middle East heard of Jesus. And what a difference sometimes a disruption can make in the life of the church. Acts of Apostles, page 105, Ellen White says, The persecution that came upon the church in Jerusalem resulted in giving a great impetus to the work of the gospel. Success had attended the ministry of the word in that place, and there was danger, look, there was danger that the disciples would linger there too long, unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world, to scatter his representatives abroad where they could work for others, God permitted persecution to come upon them. Driven from Jerusalem, the believers went everywhere preaching the word. Some of us have been praying for quite some time about returning to normal. What if, friends, our prayer needs to be different? Do we really want to simply return to normal? And some of us now may be saying, yes, yes, we need. And I get it. In so many ways, we want to and we need to go back to some kind of normalcy. But let me propose to you that the normal is sometimes what drives us away from God. My dear brothers and sisters, our prayer should not be let us return to normal. Our prayer should be let us return to God. As leaders, as we make plans for the church, let's, see, let's seek more the Lord. Let us listen more to the Holy Spirit. Let us spend more time reading the Bible where we find the pure words from the Lord. Let us plead with Jesus to help us better use church funds for the mission of seeking and saving the lost. Let us be guided by the Lord in all of our committees and decisions. Let us not allow any kind of cultural prejudice to come between us as God's family. We are one humanity in Christ. We should and we must work together respecting one another as God does with us. In God, there are no Brazilians no Mexicans, no Koreans, no Colombians, no Chinese, no Jamaicans, no Japanese, no Taiwanese, no Americans, no Europeans, no black color, no yellow color, no white color, no male, no female, no young or old in God. We are a family bought by His precious blood that was shed in agony and suffering. And so could we live together on earth as we prepare to live here together in heaven. I used to say, in God's dictionary, there is no me, there is only we. In God's Bible, there is no race, but there is a people. Let's press forward together, united by faith, to a different, brighter, and better future. If God gives us knowledge, for mission He gives. If God gives us power and influence, for mission He gives. If God gives us abundantly resources, for mission He gives. If God gives us position, for mission He gives. In the Ellen White State Office at the General Conference Headquarters, a large painting called Christ of the Narrow Way, the artist Alfred Lee portrays God's people moving along a pathway with treacherous surroundings. Many of you have seen it and have been impressed by how the artist depicts Ellen White's vision showing the tribulations and triumphs of God's last day remnant church. And as it moves along the ever-narrowing pathway, 
as long as God's people, both individually and as a united body, keep their eyes fixed on Christ at the front of the pathway, they are safe. I used to sing a song when I am anxious about what is ahead, and it calms my heart and brings me peace and assurance of God's leading in my life. And the song goes like this, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live for day to day. I don't borrow from the sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I walk beside Him, for He knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand, and I know who holds your hand, your family hands, and I know who holds our church hand, and He is the only one that will be able to take us together to the Promised Land. Let's press on by faith together to a brighter future. Let me pray for you. Lord, what a blessing for us to listen your voice this morning. Let us never be discouraged by the trials and challenges of this world, but let us all remember that all things work for the good of those who love you. And you are working through us, you are working in us, and you are working around us to prepare a people to live with you forever and ever in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.